Hey guys, it's Austin here with OutJeeping, and in today's video, we're going to be going over the Jeep 4.0 cooling system and making sure it's up to date so that way your Jeep 4.0 stays cool. And while we're in the process, we're going to figure out why this one is overheating. So let's get started. All right, so looking underneath the hood here, obviously we have a straight six 4.0 liter that's found in a lot of Jeeps. Um, it was in the Cherokee, Comanche, um, Wrangler, Grand Cherokee, and etc. cetera. Um, but right here we have it in the Cherokee XJ. This is a 99 model. And uh, just for some of you newbies, we're gonna go over all the components for a cooling system, um, in case you don't know. So to start off with, we have a radiator, and that's gonna be underneath this cross member right here, and that's basically gonna be cooling your coolant. Um, and then you have hoses that connect to the engine. So over here is our upper radiator hose, and this is where all the hot coolant from the engine goes back into the radiator for cooling. And then way down here, you probably won't be able to see it, you have your lower radiator hose, which basically when all of the coolant is cool from the radiator, it's gonna go back into the engine and uh, keep on cooling off the engine. Now over here, we have two lines coming out of the thermostat housing. These go to your heater core, so that way in the winter time, when you turn on your heat, you're gonna have uh, nice heats. That way it takes heat from the engine and transfers it inside the cab, kind of like a heat exchanger, um, the same way a radiator works. Next thing we got is cooling fans. This helps with cooling off the radiator. Um, if you're sitting in traffic or something, when the car's not always moving, it's not always having that airflow with it. So on this Jeep Cherokee model, we have a mechanical fan and then we got an electric fan. So over here on the mechanical fan, it's right behind this fan shroud right here. And this mechanical fan has a clutch on it, so basically the hotter the air is, the faster this is gonna be spinning. And if it still can't keep up, that's where this electric fan is over here. This will kick on um, when the ECM notices that the engine temperature is hot. And I believe for the 4.0, when it hits 218 degrees from the temperature sensor right here, the uh, computer will turn on the electric fan and it'll help cool off the engine. This also turns on if you have the AC on, because you want um, nice cold AC all the time. So that condenser is located in front of the radiators. So it's going to be pushing more hot air through. So the radiator is going to have to work harder to be able to cool off the engine. Now in front of the cylinder head right here, we have a thermostat housing. Um, and inside there is obviously a thermostat. And our thermostat basically monitors the coolant temperature. It's all mechanical. So um, the one that's factory in this Jeep is a 195 degree thermostat. So whenever the engine reaches that, it's going to basically open up um, the coolant. So it's like a valve. So whenever this warms up, it's going to flow coolant um, through the radiator and keep cycling the coolant. So that way this stays at a constant operating temperature. It's not too cool and it won't get too hot. Then right below it, on the front of the block, we have the water pump. Obviously this circulates all the coolant and that way you keep everything cool. Um, I should also mention this is a open cooling system. So over here we have a radiator cap and we have an overflow tube. This goes all the way to the overflow tank. And when obviously when this heats up, it's going to create pressure inside the cooling system. So on this pressure cap, it's about 16 PSI. So whenever the coolant reaches 16 PSI, it's gonna let off a little bit of coolant into the expansion tank over here. So that way, uh, obviously nothing bursts. You don't have any uh, lines like that and whenever this cools down it's going to retract that extra coolant back into the cooling system so that way it stays topped off. Alright so now that we know the basics of the cooling system we're going to go a little bit more in depth in each component and I'll tell you uh, what works the best and what are kind of myths out there that people say works the best and what actually works good. Um, so right here we have a factory uh, radiator style well it's been replaced before but the factory style is a two row radiator and it actually works the best. Um, I did have a three row radiator in my one Jeep and it does keep it cool, but once it reaches that one threshold, if it's like 90 degrees out, it actually stays at 210 and the uh, amount of CFM going through the radiator can't really keep up um, to cool it. So it does have a bigger capacity, but bigger capacity doesn't always mean uh, faster cooling. So for these Jeep 4.0s and the XJ Cherokee, it's actually best to run the factory setup. The engineers knew what they were doing, so it is a smaller radiator, but having only two rows actually helps cool it faster than having three rows um, just with the amount of airflow going through there. 
you know, when it comes to fan setup, the factory fan setup is also the best um, as long as everything is in operating condition and nothing is broken. Um, so your mechanical fan, a lot of people don't like them because they take power um, about maybe 5 to 10 horsepower off of the engine, but when you're in a Jeep it doesn't really matter that much. Um, it's not like a hot rod vehicle. Um, but you want to make sure that you have a fan shroud because otherwise if you just have a fan here with no shroud, it's not necessarily going to be drawing air through the radiator. Um, it could be drawing it from around the engine bay and that's not really doing anything because you want air to be flowing through the radiator to be able to cool properly. And same thing over here, we just have an electric fan, so you just want to make sure this is in operating condition and it's working. Um, we're going to come back to that because I believe this is actually the problem for overheating. Alright, so looking down on the top of the radiator, we have our radiator cap. And what this basically does is it monitors the uh, pressure that's in the system. So when the engine warms up, it's going to increase the pressure that's inside the cooling system because stuff expands when it gets warm. And what this cap does right here, it's actually a pressure cap. So once the pressure inside the system reaches 16 PSI, it's going to open up similar to a thermostat and let coolant through this uh, overflow tube and it's going to go all the way to the overflow tank. Um, that way it just lets out a little bit so that way it keeps at a constant pressure and then when the engine cools down it's going to retract and your coolant is going to go back into the cooling system. This kind of works out any air bubbles that are in your system because uh, air bubbles are going to go to the highest point which is over here. Um, you could also go to the upper radiator hose, but once you're uh, filling up your cooling system, you can work that out by squeezing the uh, upper radiator hose um, to help work out those air bubbles. But we're going to be talking about coolant, so once you pop this off, you want to make sure you're doing it when the engine's cold, otherwise this will spray out at you and you can get burned. Um, but you can rotate it once and it'll kind of relieve pressure, press it down, and then it should pop off. So for this Jeep, we have just a simple uh, green coolant that's in here. You want to make sure your coolant is clean, that way it's working efficiently. So obviously if you have brown um, coolant or if there's like a bunch of soot in here, you're going to have to flush your system out because all that dirt is going to prevent um, the engine from not cooling efficiently and it's going to get caught in the radiator fins and it's not going to be cooling as properly. So right here we're actually pretty good. We have a nice green coolant color. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. Now when you are filling this up, um, if you just like replace the water pump for say, and you're filling up your cooling system, you're going to want to fill it up from here first and then do the overflow tank after. Um, I usually like to fill this up and then start the engine um, until it gets to operating temperature because that helps work out the air bubbles and then cap this off when it starts flowing up because that's when the pressure starts to increase and that's going to be flowing through the overflow line into the overflow tank. So next we're going to talk about thermostats. Um, like I said before, a thermostat helps monitor that coolant temperature um, and it should be around 195 degrees. Um, a lot of people don't know a thermostat is actually a wearable part. Now a good way to know if yours needs replacing is if your operating temperature is 210 or above all the time even when it's cool out. Um, there's also factors that could also lead to that uh, same outcome but most likely you always want to replace a thermostat it's only like five bucks and then you get a gasket with it too and if your thermostat housing is uh, corroded and such you can replace that too and get that for like 10 bucks on Amazon um, but it should be 195 degrees so whenever you're running unless it's like really hot that day it should always read like just a crack under 210 which is 195 or so now a lot of people they actually run cooler thermostats it goes down to like 180 170 so if you have a cooler thermostat, you would think logically that it would open sooner and keep the engine cooler. That's not always the case with the cooling system. So if you have it open sooner, the radiator might not necessarily be able to keep up with cooling it to that temperature and it actually can be working in the opposite direction um, and actually heating up the engine more than it should. So just running a proper t thermostat is actually uh, the best thing you can do. You know, this was engineered to run um, at 195 degrees with whatever radiator setup and the fan setup. So the engineers knew what they were doing, so anything OEM is always good. Now as far as coolant hoses, um, usually you always want to replace these, especially if they're the OEM ones um, like this. This is a 21 year old vehicle, so over time the rubber hoses, they get spongy and towards the end they start to crack or whatnot, and you just want to replace them. They're not too expensive. You can get them for like 10 bucks a piece. Um, same thing goes for the heater core lines, um, they can get spongy as well. On this Jeep they all been replaced before. 
um, and you can also replace them with better hose clamps other than those uh, spring clamps that they use from the factory. The reason why they use those is because they're just quick and cheaper to do than these hose clamps, but if you're replacing these, might as well just use these ones because I've had it where uh, those spring clamps don't tighten it up enough, especially if they're old, and you'll end up with a leak. So just go to the hardware store and just get those hose clamps. Now as far as a lower radiator hose, it does come with a spring inside of the hose. Now the reason for this was because as you're under acceleration, it's going to be moving that water pump faster. So that hose tends to collapse because it's the suction hose sucking um, coolant from the radiator. And there's not really any companies that sell lower radiator hose with the spring. Now people have actually taken the spring out of the old one and put it in the new one, but it's kind of a pain in the butt and it doesn't really work. But the thing is, is rubber improves over time. So if you get a new radiator hose, it's going to be a nice firm rubber. It's not going to be as spongy and soft. So honestly, just run the one that you can get newer um, that doesn't have the spring in it and you'll be fine. I've never had any issues with uh, collapsing lower radiator hoses without that spring um, with this newer style rubber. All right, and now we're going to talk about water pumps. So this one is right down here. Might be kind of hard for you guys to see, but it's basically on the front of the block and it circulates the coolant throughout the engine and radiator, basically the whole cooling system. And you want to make sure that this is working properly. Usually it always does, um, unless you obviously have a leak or something. Basically having the OEM style water pump is usually the best. There's some high flow ones out there. Um, that help pump it faster. I've heard good things from that. Um, honestly, it's about preference. Um, I haven't had a problem with the OEM style one. You just wanna make sure that you get the right directional one because there is some engines out there and some special cooling systems that actually have a reverse rotation. Um, so obviously you don't want that because only coolant goes one way and if it's pumping the other way, it's not gonna be cooling properly because heat rises. That's how this cooling system is set up. That way all the hot coolant comes out the top of the engine and all the cool coolant goes back into the bottom of the engine. Now a way you can tell if your water pump is bad, they have a weep hole on the bottom. And basically this weep hole, it'll start leaking coolant when the bearings inside of the water pump actually are shot. So that's a uh, good sign to know that you need a water pump replacement. Um, obviously gaskets can go bad too as well. Um, I do have a video on replacing a water pump um, and I do get a lot of questions on what type of gasket, are you supposed to use RTV or anything like that? And honestly, if you have clean surfaces between the engine block and the water pump, a paper gasket is just fine. People have been using paper gaskets for far long before uh, RTV was even invented. So um, just using a paper gasket, that's what I normally like to do because I always get the surfaces nice and clean. But again, if you don't have that certain circumstance, you can always use a little bit of RTV with the paper gasket and that should do it just fine. Just make sure it's temperature rated um, so that way it can withstand the engine temperatures. Um, there's different certain types of RTV that are meant for uh, sealing up coolant. There's ones for sealing up oil so that way they don't deteriorate over time. So another thing I'm going to go over is actually the heater core. And if you got an older vehicle like this, um, more than likely you're going to have a bad heater core over time. This Jeep has over 300,000 miles and I think the previous owner actually replaced the heater core at 250,000. Um, but basically over time, the heater core um, on these Jeeps, they were made out of uh, copper and over time it actually corrodes and sometimes you'll get a little bit of a leak. And a good sign to know that if your heater core is leaking, obviously if you have coolant on the passenger side floorboard, because that's underneath the HVAC box, which is where the heater core is located. But other times if you turn on the heat, if you smell like a, a sweet kind of musty smell, that's a good sign um, that your heater core is leaking. Um, usually they don't just like blow up, they just have like a small leak and you'll notice a smell over time. So to replace that, it's actually an extensive job. You actually have to rip out the entire dash, take out the HVAC box, take that open and replace the heater core um, that's inside of there. Now with this overflow tank, also referred to as an expansion tank, um, they do have levels of coolant on the side. They have one down here that says add and then they have a full right here. You want to make sure you only put it up to the full even though it's halfway there because like I said or with the open cooling system you're going to have coolant when this engine is warm going into here so it could fill this all the way up to the top once the engine is cooled off it's going to retract all that coolant back into the cooling system when it's not under pressure anymore and this is going to go back down to the add. But when filling the system you want to make sure it's topped off at the radiator and then topped off in here and then 
this open cooling system it's naturally going to work out the air bubbles um, so that way it's cooling efficiently now looking over here on a the thermostat housing we have a temperature sensor and this obviously monitors the temperature of your engine and how warm it's going um, so this is the 9701 Cherokee so they only have one temperature sensor now the older 4.0s they actually have two or on the older ones they just have one but in a different location so if they have two they have one up here in the thermostat and then one on the back of the block on the cylinder head and if it's even an older one they just have that single one on the back of the block um, that monitors coolant but you obviously want this in working condition make sure it's plugged in and it's reading properly when these go bad they usually don't read as high as what it should be it might like read 160 when it's uh, normal operating uh, temperature and obviously that's incorrect you can get these replaced for like about 20 30 bucks all right so now that we went over all the components um, for the cooling system and if everything is up to date and everything working properly you should have an efficient cooling system now for me I have most of these parts actually replaced um, I did water pump thermostat radiator fan shroud everything like that and this Jeep actually does have an overheating issue um, especially when it's on a warm day and you have the AC running uh, so if you have the AC running like I said earlier um, it's gonna actually have warmer air going through the radiator because it's in front of the radiator so um, it's not exactly the coolest air so to compensate for that there's an electric fan right here so with the AC on the computer is going to tell this electric fan to start running so that way it keeps at an optimal temperature you still have the cool AC and that the engine is not overheating and I recently found out that this fan it's actually broken so I'm going to show you guys how to test this um, it's actually pretty simple you can do it a couple of ways and then I'm going to show you guys how to replace this electric fan right here so if the 97 to 06 uh, 4.0 is an easy way to tell if your electric fan is working or not um, instead of waiting for it to warm up to operating temperature um, what you can actually do is remove this uh, plug on the temperature sensor or if the computer program does it is if it's not reading any temperature it's going to throw on that electric fan anyway because it's not going to know how warm the engine is and it doesn't want it to overheat so it's going to kick on that fan once you unplug the sensor um, obviously I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want this uh, warm to work on but I'm going to show you another way on how to test your electric fan to make sure it's working so coming over to the passenger side engine bay over here we have our fuse and a relay box um, that's on the Cherokee it might be in different locations on other Jeep models but for over here inside this box we have a relay for our electric fan so all we have to do is take out that relay and jump to terminals to give it power and we can see if our electric fan is working so I'm just going to pop this off and on the back side here they have a little diagram so on the bottom right over here we have cooling fan so I'm just going to pull out that relay quick and I'm going to save you guys some uh, research if you jump pins 87 and 30 um, it's going to give direct power to that electric fan um, they do have them stamped right here on the underside of the relay so you can correspond the numbers that are on the back of the here to what's down here in the relay box so I just got my jumper wire right here and I'm just going to stick it in pins 30 and 87 so that's going to be this right one and then the far left. Now as you can hear there is no electric fan going so let's go over there and take a look. Alright so obviously we don't have a fan turning I'm going to spin this by hand and you can hear that right there. It's a little bit of a buzzing sound so it tells me that the brushes in the motor for this are actually shot and it's not spinning at all even if I help it kind of just gave up so um, obviously um, another way you can test um, even if you have power over here is you can unplug the plug that's down here take a multimeter see if you're getting 12 volts if you're getting 12 volts that means you're getting power to the fan and if it's still not working then your fan needs replacing so this one obviously it's shot so we're going to be taking this out and I got a new one to replace it with alright so first step to removing this electric fan is we have to remove this overflow tube um, normally from factory they don't have a hose clamp but this one does have a hose clamp so we're just going to undo that one quick and then pull it off of where it's connected to the radiator and now we're just going to set that up so that way it doesn't spill any coolant because there is a little bit of coolant that's in this line so the next thing we're going to do is the electrical connector and that's going to be over here um, there is a red safety clip on it you're going to want to push that sideways and then pinch the connector and pull it apart 
Um, this one, since it's been off so many times, that's actually broken and got brittle. So this one just unplugs simply like that. Now the next thing that's holding it in is we have two eight millimeter bolts that go um, straight into this core support right here. So the one going down in here and one going over here. Um, I only have one and the other one's zip tied because uh, the tab on the electric fan actually broke off over time. So I'm just gonna cut this zip tie. And then next undo this eight millimeter bolt. All right, so with that out, all we have to do is lift up and it should pop out from the bottom of the radiator support because that's where it's connected to on the bottom and then we should be able to remove it. Um, this one, it's actually uh, broken on the bottom. The tabs are broken down there because over time, plastic on these gets brittle from all the heat cycles. So this one just lifts right out. And I forgot to mention that the wire harness that's on the Jeep side is actually has a plastic Christmas tree hook in it, so you just want to undo that quick, pop that out, and then you should be able to remove this. Like I said before, these tabs are broken off, um, so that's not going to be able to clip into the bottom, but good thing we got a new one. Alright, so we got the new and old electric fan side by side. We're just going to look over and make sure they're the same part, because you don't obviously want to uh, replace a part that's not the same. Um, so over here we have the same electrical connector as what we do over here, so that's good. And then, like I was saying before, they have these plastic tabs that are on the bottom of the fan, and this is going to help clip into the radiator, so that way it's attached on the bottom, that way it's not, you know, moving around. So everything on here looks identical. If you're wondering where I got this, I'll post a link in the description below. Um, it's basically an electric fan for a Cherokee, and it's only like 50 bucks with great reviews. So let's get started to uh, install this new fan. So before reinstalling this, I'm just going to show you the tabs at the bottom of the electric fan it goes into. So these tabs right here, we got one on this side and then one corresponding on the other side. And that's where those uh, metal clips are actually going to clip down into, so that way it's attached on this lower part. So we're just going to sneak this new fan down in here. I'm going to hold the electrical connector out of the way. It is a little bit tight, but we just want to fish this down in there. And then try and line up the tabs that correspond with the radiator. And then once we're in the right place, just push them down, you can hear it click. And then the other one pops in like that. And if you try lifting it up, it should be secure on the bottom. So now we'll take our eight millimeter bolt, thread it through the hole and into the core support. And now on the other side, um, since I'm missing a bolt, I'm just gonna use the zip tie. It should work for now um, to get that in there. And then tighten that up and then cut it off. Now we got our electrical connector. We'll push back together until it clicks. And then you can, uh, if you have a red safety clip, um, if it's not broke off, push that to the side and it'll lock it into place. Then lastly, we just have our overflow tube. We'll reconnect that over here to the top of the radiator. All right, so I'm just gonna test it like how we did earlier. Um, doing the same way, you can test it by uh, pulling that plug or just jumping the relay over here. So that's what I'm gonna do, just to show you guys that that was a problem. So we got power there and everything works. I'm just going to plug the relay back in and then put our fuse box back together. All right, and that's pretty much it. All right, guys, that's going to be a wrap for today's video. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed it and you found it helpful. Um, hopefully it'll help you diagnose your cooling issue problems if you have any um, and what to look for in case you do have any problems that you don't even know about. Um, as far as replacing the electric fan, it's pretty straightforward to do. So I thought I could uh, go over some of the cooling stuff in case you guys don't already know about it. But if you found this video helpful, make sure to like and subscribe to the OutGP YouTube channel to help keep these videos coming. And if you have any questions or comments, make sure to post them below and I'll be happy to answer for you guys. Until next time, I'll see you guys in the next how-to.